My name's Janet McLean and it's my great pleasure to welcome you tonight to talk about Brexit, uh, Britain leaving the EU. And we have just been so fortunate in the law school that in the same week we happen to have two um, UK experts on the EU, on Brexit, on how it will impact on both Scotland and the wider UK. Uh, so without more ado, I, it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Paul Craig, the Professor of English Law at the University of Oxford. He's taught many of you, I gather, um, and is well known to New Zealand audiences. He's uh, an expert on constitutional and administrative law in the UK. He's written extensively on EU law. He's been an interpreter of EU law for a British public, um, and he's recently been an expert witness at the UK House of Lords Constitutional Committee on the Great Repeal Bill, of which we'll be hearing more. It's my pleasure, too, to welcome Professor Alan Page, um, a former and wonderful colleague of mine at the University of Dundee. Um, he's written the leading work on Scottish constitutional law since devolution. Um, he, too, has um, been... Uh, deeply engaged in EU law and has been, written a very influential paper on the impact of Brexit on Scotland, uh, which has been cited in a number of parliamentary committees, both at Westminster and at Edinburgh. So we're very lucky to have people here at this time when the world is changing so quickly and so uh, rapidly that no one can keep up with it. Um, so without further ado, I welcome Professor Paul Craig to speak to us. Janet, thank you so much for the kind welcome. I would only like to mention right at the beginning that normally I don't take a glass of red wine. <laughs> <laughs> Not before 11 o'clock in the morning. Uh, in any event. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much indeed. Alan and I are going to um, divide up the general topic. So I, Alan great expertise in Scotland and on EU law more generally, but it seemed sensible tonight that we both speak for about 20 minutes and that I would talk about some of the general issues concerned with Brexit and that Alan would focus in particular on the Scottish dimension broadly conceived. So what I thought would be helpful, um, because there are a huge number of legal, constitutional and political issues concerning Brexit, what would be helpful, I thought, in the time available, I'm very happy to take questions on any aspect of the topic, but what would seem to me to be very helpful now would be if I gave some sort of roadmap through Article 50 and through the different stages of Brexit and looking at the constitutional and legal issues and the political backdrop to them, because that seemed to me at least um, a way into this minefield of different legal and constitutional issues. So that's what I'm going to do, but as I said, I'm very happy to take questions more broadly on any aspect of this. So. Article 50 was a new article in the Lisbon Treaty. There was not an escape clause or withdrawal clause beforehand. There was debate about whether a state could withdraw. The best version or the best view about that was that it was or was that a state could leave and that the rules about withdrawal would probably be drawn from the Vienna Convention on the Law of, the of, the Law of Treaties, given that this was or is the master plan for treaty interpretation. But that was no longer needed because in the, uh, pretty much everything in the Lisbon Treaty is actually taken from the Constitutional Treaty of 2004. The Constitutional Treaty was, never became reality because of the negative votes in referenda in France and Holland, but pretty much everything new 
in the Lisbon Treaty is carried over from the, the uh, Constitutional Treaty, including Article 50, or the substance of Article 50. Article 50 was first written, and the idea was not, uh, not that it would be used by a state such as the UK, it was used, it was in the best view from, some jo from, from Sir John Kerr uh, and Giuliano Amato, two of the leading lights uh, in the constitutional, um, uh, who framed the, um, the constitutional treaty. The idea behind Article 50 was that actually it was going to be a way of kicking out a recalcitrant state. The real idea was that if a state started going um, absent without leave and started becoming too autocratic, then in effect what would happen is that Article 50 would be the way to push it out the door rather than the state actually seeking to leave. No one, would act no one actually thought at the time that the state would seriously wish to leave. Okay, so that much just by way of background. So, Article 50, what are the different stages in constitutional and legal terms? Well, stage one has already happened. Stage one is that it's for the state in question to trigger Article 50 in accordance with the constitutional requirements of that state. And... That is exactly what has happened in the UK. The Prime Minister triggered Article 50 on the 29th of March, having, however, had a long <coughs> fight in the courts about exactly what the constitutional requirements of the United Kingdom were in this respect. The judgment ended up uh, being given first of all by the Divisional Court in the Miller litigation, and then it went straight from the Divisional Court to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court held by eight to three, one powerful dissent by Lord Reed in particular, but it held by eight to three, that the executive could not trigger withdrawal from or under Article 50, that in accordance with the constitutional requirements of the United Kingdom, the triggering required parliamentary approval for a statute. It could not be undertaken by and through the prerogative. There was lots of controversial argument or lots of contestable arguments put about this. The case rapidly became the most uh, blogged about case in um, English legal history, and that is a record which will not easily be broken. It made history as well by um, being the first instance or the first case where four days of Supreme Court coverage um, was uh, streamed continuously, knocking Coronation Street off its previous <laughs> ascendancy in the TV ratings. And uh, the judgment was given. As I said, it was eight to three. That was pretty widely predicted. The, everyone, in fact, had predicted it was going to be seven to four rather than eight to three. People then wondered about, well, who switched sides at the last moment, and that's not clear. My own view is, in fact, um, a rather heterodox view, but I think almost certainly true, which is that the Russian hackers <laughs> time on the US election and then were uh, messing up the French election with Fillon and in between had revealed the denouement of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> so they were really pretty really busy and they could only get their B team um, onto the hacking of the result in Miller in the Supreme Court and therefore they got it one out, you know, seven, four, eight, three, hey, it's not, not a big deal. But that's in effect what happened. Um, now, Lots and lots of argumentation amongst constitutional scholars about whether the decision was right or wrong. There are two views about this. 
the right view and the wrong view. <laughs> the right view is that the Supreme Court got it right um, by the majority. The wrong view is that they got it wrong. Uh, I think that they did get it right. I don't think that the issues were straightforward. But on a serious note, I think that they did get it right. And I actually do think that they not only got it right analytically, I think it actually, the decision coheres with one's intuition about constitutional argumentation and result in the following sense. If you think about it, stand back from it, this was the withdrawal from the EU, whether you are a Remainer or a Brexiteer, is the most important single decision of a peacetime nature concerning a treaty which has ever been made by the UK. Now, actually, if you stand back and think about it in that, in that way, the very idea that the executive should be able to do this autonomously without um, uh, securing approval from Parliament is actually quite extraordinary. I mean, it's quite extraordinary that anyone could imagine that that would be or should be the right result in normative terms, it beggars belief. Uh, actually, but that's not the reason why I think I, they got it right. I think they got it right because I think that the unorthodox constitutional reasoning, the classic limits on the prerogative uh, apply, and the classic limits derived from the case of proclamations and to Kaiser apply with the consequence that um, the executive could not rely on the prerogative in this particular case and they had to have recourse to Parliament. Final word on Miller, just by way of footnote, but interesting political footnote, because everything in this whole area is an admixture of the legal and the political. I mean, just everything. So the real, uh, one of the interesting political questions with the small and large P is why the case was ever fought. And the answer to that is simply not obvious. Um, the Prime Minister didn't have to fight this case. She didn't. She could, in October or November, have gone to uh, the House of Commons and simply said, I do not accept, as a matter of legal principle, that I have to seek your authorization before triggering Article 50. I do not concede that point. But I'm going to seek it anyway. So she didn't have to, she wouldn't have to fight it legally. Her legal advisors could not possibly have given her any more, any better than odds of 50-50 winning. And that would be putting it high. So she could, she didn't have to fight this case. Could have saved the taxpayer a lot of money. And of course, once you put things in the hands of the court, you never know what the outcome's going to be because you're putting it in the hands of the court. And as happened when the Parliament did consider the matter in uh, late February, early March, she could have produced in November exactly the kind of bill that she produced in early March, a two-line bill with precisely 164 words, if you really are going to be pedantic about it. And that's all she produced and that secured passage through both Houses of Parliament and received royal assent without a single amendment being forced against the government. She could have secured exactly the same outcome in November. So one of the interesting things historically is when 30 year, the 30-year rule has passed, whether we find documentation indicating as to why actually she did bother to fight it. Anyway, that's all stage one, and that's happened. So it's triggered. So what happens now? What are the legal, political issues which happen next? Well, the legal, political issues which happen next are exactly the things going on now. Under Article 50, the next stage is that the European Council puts together guidelines for the Brexit negotiations. The European Council is the body within the European Union which consists of the heads of state, the heads of government, the presidents, prime ministers of the 28 member states. It has a permanent or semi-permanent president, President Tusk from Poland, who's now in his second term. The way it works is that President Tusk has put together 
the guidelines or draft of the guidelines. You can't draft in the committee of 27, 28. So Tusk put together a draft of the guidelines, presenting it to the other 27, to the 27 member states, saying, here is what I think the guidelines for the negotiation should be. Once those guidelines are agreed, the actual negotiations are undertaken by the Commission, and the Commission, the person representing the Commission is a very seasoned, very professional and very clever man from France, Michel Barnier. He is going to be a tough negotiator. He's not going to give an inch uh, or um, anything else, as it were, to, to the British in that respect. Now, the position of the other European institution, or one of the other European institutions, is important as well. The European Parliament has no formal position or role in the Brexit negotiations. There's no formal position, no formal role in the Brexit negotiations. But it does have voice in the following sense. Any withdrawal agreement which is made, and I'll say more about the nature of the withdrawal agreement in a moment, any withdrawal agreement which is made has to uh, obtain the approval of the European Parliament. So, the European Parliament's views are going to matter. And only today, literally today, the uh, European Parliament put forward its guidelines Okay, so the European Parliament has survived and prospered by doing what parliaments have done in every country in the world, which is taken the power they've got and used it as a ratchet to get more or to maximise their input. So they know they have no voice in the actual negotiations, but they're putting on the table, these are our guidelines and therefore they're sending a signal to the other political branches of government to say, be careful, make sure that you do not end up with an agreement which transgresses the guidelines which we are putting down, because if you do, you do so at your peril. They have a veto, all right? If they don't approve it, if they don't approve a withdrawal agreement, that's it. Um, subject of political arm twisting and all that sort of stuff later. Okay, so that's what's happening now. So what's going? What what are the legal modalities? So stage three. What are the legal modalities moving forward? Well, what Article Fifty provides for is at least two agreements, perhaps three, but it provides for at least two agreements. There is a withdrawal agreement. And that's the main game in town under Article 50, the divorce, okay? Article 50 is also framed in terms not only of a withdrawal agreement, but Article 50 speaks in terms of the, uh, the idea that while you're negotiating the withdrawal agreement, there may also be discourse about future trade relations between the UK and the EU. Now, so this is stage three of our game, as it were, or stage three of the process. Now, just to make it absolutely clear, there's the, uh, um, to make clear the nature of these two agreements. So you have the withdrawal agreement and the future trade relations agreement. Now, I think what's very important to emphasize is the respective content of these agreements is not fixed in stone. You could have a fat divorce, a withdrawal agreement which was really quite meaty and contained an awful lot, with the consequence that the agreement concerning future trade relations was actually relatively thin by way of comparison. You could alternatively have a, have a scenario where the divorce agreement, the withdrawal agreement is relatively thin, and an awful lot is left for resolution in the future trade relationship. What's the key criterion which determines the fatness and relative fatness and thinness of the two agreements? It's this. If 
the UK had gone for what is known in the jargon of the trade as a soft Brexit solution. If it had gone for a soft Brexit solution, other things being equal, a strong likelihood that the withdrawal agreement would be quite fat and the future trade relationship agreement would be quite thin. Why? On the soft Brexit option, the soft Brexit option is predicated on the idea that the state in question models itself rather on the, uh, the model of Norway and the other states which are part of the European economic area. And uh, states which belong to the EEA get full access to the single market and the customs union pretty much. But the quid pro quo is that they have to accept the full rigours of the four freedoms, including free movement of people. Hard Brexiteers have never been willing to accept that. But just still sticking to the fatness and thinness of the two agreements, if the UK had gone down the soft Brexit solution, if they had, then the withdrawal agreement would almost certainly be modelled directly on the EEA agreement, of which there is a detailed boilerplate there. It's a long treaty which already exists. You would take that, you would cut and paste it, you would put it into your withdrawal agreement, and that would there wouldn't be very much left to be dealt with by a future trade agreement. However, the UK has not gone down the soft Brexit solution. The UK has gone down the road of hard Brexit. A hard Brexit meaning that the government is uh, saying, no, we're not seeking access to the single market and probably not the customs union either, because that will only come uh, with the price tag of free movement, which the hard Brexiteers within the Tory party are not willing to accept. What that means in terms of the relative content of the withdrawal agreement and the future trade relations agreement is this. It is very likely, it is very likely that the um, withdrawal agreement will be quite thin. It will be a quickie divorce, but it will not be simple or easy. Quickie in the sense that the content put into the um, withdrawal agreement is going to be relatively small. What will it contain? It will contain the financial settlement. At the moment, there is a wide gap between the two sides. The bill for Britain's exit is somewhere between 28 and 60 billion, um, uh, more than I earn in a week. And, um, uh, and uh, there's going to be very hard negotiation about that sum. But also, in that divorce, there's other, you know, big issues. The, the almost certainly uh, the rights of EU citizens in the UK and UK citizens in Europe will become part of the divorce settlement. So too will important institutional issues. The European Banking Authority and the EMA, the European Medicines Authority, are both situated in London. They're going to be moved. They're going to be pulled out. And that's going to have important consequences uh, of various kinds as well. That will probably all be included in the withdrawal agreement. It probably won't contain much else, which is, we might, but I doubt whether it'll end up containing much else, which is why the PM, our PM's bargaining position is, we want, the UK wants uh, negotiation about withdrawal and negotiation about the future trade agreement to happen in parallel, okay? They know that the content of the divorce is going to be relatively thin, that agreement. They know the real game in town in terms of future trade relations and safeguarding the position of the city and all that and preventing a meltdown of the UK economy is going to happen because of the content of the trade agreement, which is why they want the two to go in parallel. So we have not only a substantive issue, which is what's the content of the respective agreements, there's also a process issue, which gets discussed first. Now, as I've just mentioned, the UK's bargaining position is we want 
both of them discussed in parallel. It is not fortuitous that one of the very headline issues that came out from Tusk in the guidelines for the European Council and that came out from the European Parliament in their bargaining guidelines is, in technical legal terms, no way. <laughs> no way. They said uh, the formulation varied, but in technically uh, the, the substance was there is no way we're having parallel talks going through at the same time. We are going to have, their view is, we're going to have to have significant progress on the divorce stricto sensu before we even begin to pick up any issues concerning the future trade relationship. Okay? Now just... Uh, I know limits of time, but just a word more about, about this issue, this stage three. Why is this all so important? It's so important because if everything, if an awful lot has to be done by an FTA, a, future, uh, a free trade agreement of some kind, then one has to be mindful of the logistics, in every sense of the term, of negotiating FTAs. Now, this all may be known to everyone, but in case it's not, let me just put a few kind of basics on the table here. The average FTA is not a livre de poche. It's not a book at bedtime, and it weighs in at a chubby 260-odd pages. That is actually quite small concern to some, uh, compared to some of the FTAs, the FTA between Canada and the EU weighed in at about 1,600 pages, all right? Not rocket science to understand that the longer the FTA, its length is commensurate with how ambitious, it is, how ambitious it is. The core of a free trade agreement is about tariffs. It's uh, usually mainly about goods, uh, and it's about tariffs and customs duties and... Uh, equivalent um, conditions for trade. The more ambitious you want your trade agreement to be, if you want it to cover services, if you want it to cover IP, if you want it to cover competition, then it gets bigger and fatter and it takes longer to negotiate. Average FTAs, are, uh, we, the average FTA takes somewhere between four and six years to negotiate. Okay, and there's and that's leaving aside, that's leaving aside, as it were, political goodwill or bad will, as the case may be in this instance. What that all means is that there's a strong likelihood that at the end of the two-year period, an Article 50 has a two-year deadline in it, by which time the withdrawal agreement has to be made or certain consequences follow, about which I'll say one word in a moment. But basically, what that all means, what that all means is the following. What that all means is I have one minute left. Um, <laughs> uh, um, so what that means is that almost certainly there'll have to be a third agreement called a transitional agreement. Now, everything about the nature of a transitional agreement is uncertain. Just about everything. Its legal provenance is uncertain. Its legal nature is uncertain. And its legal content is uncertain. Except everyone's beginning to turn the knife. Everyone's beginning to turn the knife in a nice, delicate way. So the Parliament is beginning to turn the knife by saying, if you have a transitional agreement, to ease the passage between withdrawal and a future trade agreement, then of course the European Court of Justice will have to have full authority over the terms of it, which is enough to cause political apoplexy amongst the backbenches of the Tory party. 30 seconds, stage four. Stage four, part four, and then I stop. Stage four, there is a two-year deadline. If no agreement is reached within two years, then what Article 50 states is that unless all the member states of the European Council agree to an extension of time, 
we the UK fall off the edge of the cliff, that is, rights and obligations under EU law cease to apply at the end of that two year period. Which means that in legal terms you default to the WTO default position, which would almost certainly be very harmful to the UK economy. Uh, but if there is a reasonable likelihood that we could end up in a situation where no agreement is reached and where we do indeed fall off the edge of the cliff. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
Now, the Supreme Court reached this conclusion despite, in Scotland's case, a convention called the Sewell Convention after the author, despite the Sewell Convention whereby the UK Parliament does not legislate with regard to, does not normally legislate with regard to devolved matters without the Scottish Parliament's consent, having been written into the Scotland Act 2016 in implementation of the recommendations of an all-party uh, commission which was set up immediately after the first independence referendum, the 2014 independence referendum, to agree uh, changes to the devolution settlement. Now, Janet tells me that uh, this is all the rage. That's on. It's on, so all I need to do is this. <laughs> But rather, yeah. So this is the this is the. Maybe I should. Can you all see? This is the key provision of the Scotland Act, which, as you could see, confers a power on the Scottish Parliament to make laws for Scotland. And then it says, Section Twenty Eight Seven, there in an affirmation of the continuing sovereignty of the United <coughs> Kingdom Parliament, that this. Uh, power of this section does not affect the power of the Parliament of the United Kingdom to make laws for Scotland. And then section 28.8 is the Sewell Convention uh, written into statute. What the, what the Supreme Court said about this was that in writing the Convention into the Act, the UK Parliament was not seeking to convert it into a rule which can be interpreted, let alone enforced, by the courts. Rather, it was simply recognising the convention for what it is, namely a political convention, and is effectively declaring it is a permanent feature of the devolution settlement. While the convention had an important role in facilitating harmonious relations between the UK Parliament and the devolved legislature, the Supreme Court continued, the policing of its scope and the manner of its operation were matters for the political rather than the judicial process. I'll remove that and let Paul sit down. <laughs> Now, some reaction to the Miller case, the Supreme Court judgment, has been to the effect that Section 28.8 is not worth the paper it's written on. That's not a view I share, or shared certainly before the events of the last two weeks, because in my view, the Convention remains no less politically binding than before. So the question of the Scottish Parliament's consent to the legislative consequences of Brexit, which I'll come on to in a moment, in my view, has thus only been delayed, not settled, by the Supreme Court's decision. Now, whether that's still the case, I think, remains to be seen. But last Thursday, the day after the Prime Minister triggered Article 50, um, the Scottish First Minister wrote to the Prime Minister seeking sanction for a second referendum on Scottish independence. And if I have a question, it is whether by pushing the referendum button early, pressing the refer referendum button early, the Scottish Government may not have deprived itself of the leverage which the threat of a referendum would have afforded it in negotiations over the implications of Brexit for the devolution settlement, which I'll come on to in a moment. But first, let me say something about a piece of legislation which is commonly referred to as the Great Repeal Bill. At the Conservative Party conference last October, the Prime Minister announced that the next Queen's speech would include a Great Repeal Bill. And I always have to pinch myself when that title is used without any suggestion or hint of irony. <laughs> no doubt it's intended to echo the Great Reform Act of 1832, which put the parliamentary franchise on, a, on its current basis or on started the reform of the franchise. But as announced by the Prime Minister, what this piece of legislation will do is three things. First, and this got the largest cheer from the audience, it will repeal the European Communities Act 1972, which gives effect to EU law in the United Kingdom. In so doing, it will return, or so we're told, power to UK politicians and institutions. Okay, the difficulty with that is that after more than 40 years of membership, EU law is woven into the fabric of UK law to such an extent that simply repealing the Act 
without doing anything else, would result in legal chaos. So the second thing the Act will do, therefore, in the interests of legal certainty, will be to convert EU law into domestic law. The idea being that UK law will be the same one minute after midnight as it is one minute before midnight on the day the UK leaves. And the idea is then that it will be for the UK Parliament or the devolved legislatures, as the case may be, uh, to decide which elements of that law to keep, uh, to amend, or to repeal. <coughs> but from the very beginning, it's been recognised, and it's become clearer and clearer, that not all this or such EU-derived law will be operable in its own terms. Quite a lot of it will simply make no sense. It refers to EU law, it refers to EU institutions, it refers to other member states. It will simply be inoperable. So the last thing the bill will do will be to enable changes to be made by secondary legislation to laws, and I quote, that would otherwise not function sensibly once we've left the EU, so that our legal system continues to function correctly outside the EU. And one of the consequences of Brexit, therefore, will be a massive transfer of legislative power from Parliament to the executive. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Repeal, convert, correct. That's all there is to it. Needless to say, it won't be. Which is why the Great Repeal Bill will be accompanied by as many as, some say, 15 other bills, making this, and I've been trying to think of parallels, probably the heaviest or the most substantial legislative program since the end of the Second World War. So we're talking about not just a Great Repeal Bill, but a Great Repeal Bill plus bills on immigration, tax, agriculture, trade and customs, fisheries, data protection, sanctions, plus bills on EU migrant benefits, reciprocal health care arrangements, road freight, nuclear safeguards, emissions tra tra trading, and the transfer of spending from various EU funds to individual government departments. What are the Scottish Parliament's consent? As I've said, my view is that the question has been delayed, not settled by uh, the Miller case. Whether its consent is required or not will depend, obviously, on the terms in which the bill is drafted. Um, but the question of its consent will inevitably arise if, as seems clear now, the powers of the devolved administrations are to be altered. The Secretary of State for Scotland has been reported as saying that it's fair to anticipate that the Great Repeal Bill will be the subject of a legislative pro consent process. And then there are all the other bills, some of which relate to devolved matters, that's to say matters within the competence of the Scottish Parliament, which could be the subject of separate Scottish legislation or else legislated for by Westminster with the consent of the Scottish Parliament under the Convention. Now, I have absolutely no doubt that the UK government's preference will be to proceed on the basis of consent, but whether that consent will be forthcoming, the Scottish Parliament's consent will be forthcoming, given the veto of a second independence referendum remains to be seen. But what is clear, and if you can recall Section 28.7 of the Scotland Act, which said this section does not affect the power of the United Kingdom Parliament to legislate for Scotland, what is clear, as a matter of law, is that the Parliament cannot, by withholding its consent, prevent the Great Repeal Bill or any other bill in the Brexit legislative programme from, from becoming law. My final subject, the implications of the devolution settlement. The referendum meant that there was, in Scotland, in Scotland the referendum never really happened. Um, I'm not quite sure why that was, possibly because nobody actually spoke against the idea that we should continue to be members of the European Union. Um, we'd had a referendum two years before, there was undoubtedly an element of voter fatigue in it. There was also a sense in which this was a Conservative Party argument. It was an argument south of the border <coughs> which didn't really resonate uh, in Scotland. And there was little surprise, therefore, uh, when Scotland um, <coughs> voted uh, in favour uh, of remaining. But what there was in the immediate aftermath of the result was, well, what does this mean for us? What are we going to be able to legislate about? Uh, and you had members of the Scottish Parliament running around rubbing their hands saying, you know, this will mean more legislative powers for us. And I was asked, this was 
last, at the end of last July to give some advice on what this would mean for the um, Scottish Parliament's legislative competence. A piece of work that several people said could not be done given the sheer scale uh, of EU legislation. But I found a way of doing it simply by mapping Schedule 5 to the Scotland Act, which sets out the matters which are reserved to Westminster, onto a set of EU competences. The idea being that once I'd worked out which were reserved, then all the others would fall uh, logically uh, to the Scottish Parliament. And I had no real preconceptions of what I was going to find when I started on this piece of work. But what I did find, to my surprise, was that as I went through individual EU competences, the vast majority of them were actually reserved. They belonged to Westminster. Some would go to the Scottish Parliament, yes, and the ones that I identified were Justice and Home Affairs, Agriculture, Fisheries, the Environment, on the two other minor ones, but the free movement of goods, persons, services, capital, the negotiation and conclusion of trade agreements with non-EU countries, all of that would go to uh, Westminster. Uh, so the accretion of powers for the Scottish Parliament uh, would be relatively limited. Question. So I asked myself, well, why is that? Why should that be? Um, and the answer, of course, is that if you go through the, the powers in question, most of them turn out to be single market related. In other words, they're about preserving the UK single market, which, if you like, is the counterpart or the analog of the EU single market. Um, so that was a picture of which I went, which I came up with, and I went on to make two key points. One, if you didn't amend the Scotland Act, if the Scotland Act wasn't to be amended, then the Scottish Parliament's legislative competence would be exactly the same one minute after midnight, as it would be one minute before midnight on the day the UK leaves. But what would change? would be that what were, the terminology I used was nominal as opposed to real, what were essentially nominal competences, because the decisions relating to them were all taken in Brussels, agriculture being a very good example. So the Scottish government, Scottish parliament, simply implements what's decided in Brussels. These would become real competences for the first time. I've used various language in which to describe that or try and get that across to politicians of various um, stripes, um, full fat competence as opposed to no fat or low fat competence, <laughs> competence max as opposed to competence light. So I made that point, and the second point that I made was that this in turn opened up the prospect of different parts of the United Kingdom riding off in different directions armed with these parts, and with it the fragmentation of the UK single market. Do I know? That to give you the one minute. Oh, the one minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the black patch. Um, um, so that's what I said last August. Um, come forward five months to that Prime Minister's speech at Lancaster House that I mentioned. Um, and she said this. First of all, that no devolved competences would be resumed, taken back from the devolved legislatures. I should be equally clear that no decisions currently taken by the both devolved administrations will be removed from. But the exercise of devolved competences, she went on to say, should not result in new barriers to trade. So our guiding principle will be to ensure that as we leave the EU, no new barriers to living and doing business within our own nation are created. Now since then, and I'm cutting the story a little bit short, but since then the first of these principles has undergone something of a revision. It's no longer the promise that no decisions currently taken by the devolved administrations will be removed from them. Instead, it is the expectation that the outcome will be a significant increase in the decision-making power of each devolved administration. So in the letter that the Prime Minister sent to Donald Tusk, she said exactly that. But the second principle remains unchanged. So in the Brexit Bill White Paper published last Thursday, the government said, as powers are repatriated, it will be important to ensure that the effective functioning of the UK single market is maintained. Now, when I last spoke about this to parliamentary committees at Westminster, 
Um, I said that we need to wait to see how, if at all, these two principles would or could be uh, reconciled. But taking agriculture as an example, I speculated that one possibility might be a UK common agricultural policy replacing the EU common agricultural policy, which gave the devolved administrations at least as much and probably more freedom to tailor the policy to their own circumstances uh, than the EU policy. Now, I'm conscious I've run over my minute. Um, we've had uh, the Great Repeal Bill White Paper, which was published last Thursday, the day after the Article 50 notification was given. It is, I think the best you can say about it, it is a work in progress. Um, it says very little of substance. It's, it's evident that there's a vast amount that still needs to be argued over. Um, if I had a crystal ball, which I most certainly don't, uh, what I would have said uh, is that what, we, what we'll see is sound and fury over a referendum, which is after all what the SNP want, resistance to any form of power grab, what Scotland has, Scotland keeps, but alongside that, cooperation dictated by the practical exigencies of the situation, this two-year clock which is running down that Paul talked about. Scotland, after all, needs a post-Brexit agricultural policy just as much as every other part of the United Kingdom. And if it's not going to get it from Brussels, where else is it going to get it but London? My bone best guess, therefore, remains a UK cap common agricultural policy, which will afford the devolved administrations at least as much freedom to adapt to their own circumstances as the EU regime. What not to like was my reaction when I first thought about this. Rather a lot, as I suspect we're all going to find out. Thank you very much.